class, congratulations on getting through to the, the final week of code in place. This is week five. And this week we're going to de be dealing with lists. You also learned about dictionaries in lecture, and that's a very interesting and useful topic, but we aren't going to be covering that in section today. And we're also going to be covering files. So they have, um, it's a very different kind of section this week. Uh, instead of having you write the code, the, the first one, they actually want me to show you the code. But I'm going to do it slightly different. I'm going to actually walk through this code in the Python interpreter so you can really see what's going on. So we're, this week we're learning about lists. Lists are, um, you may be familiar in other languages with arrays, which are very basic. Um, but then other languages such as Java have lists as well. And in Python, lists are like arrays, and they're also like Java lists, uh, but they can contain any type of object, which is unusual. So let's fire up Python, and let's try creating a list. Um, my list. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, for quickness, I'm going to say my list equals, and then we we can start out with nothing. So if I type my list, it'll show us that it's the empty list. And we can look at the length of a list by doing len of my list. And it's going to give us zero. So there's zero elements in there. So we can add an element to a list by doing my list.append. And let's try adding a string first. Hello. Now what's my list? My list is now a single element. Hello. And we can look at the length. And it's now one. Let's do my list.append. And remember I said you could append um, have multiple different types of items. So let's append the number two and my list.append a floating point, 3.5, and my list.append. And let's do a Boolean true. Now what is my list? And what is the length of my list? Four. So there's the length is four. There's one, two, three, four items near, but they're not. Uh, when we index them, we have to index them starting at zero. So my list of zero. By the way, another student asked this week, why are the indices starting at zero? Uh, various reasons, but if you think back to the original days of computers, when we had, you know, the first computer I worked on had 3,583 bytes. You really want to take advantage of every single byte and every single possible value. So if you don't use value zero as an indice, then you're losing the ability to index 256 items. You, you're limited 255. So I would say that's the best reason is to, to be efficient. But so my list zero is going to be hello. And then my list of four is going to be, tr oh, it's, it's, it doesn't exist. That's exactly what I was trying to show you. So even though there are four items in there, the index to the last one is the length minus one. So oh, I can look at my list of three. And again, so if I do my list with the length of my list, this is not going to work. This is going to be out of bounds. So I have to do that minus one. And that'll give me the last item. So now let's take a look at the simpler example they gave us here with a bunch of names. Let's put that, oops, uh, paste that in here. So now we look at names. And we can append a name here. We can do a names.append with, I think I misspelled that, yep. with Carol. And now we can look at names. Uh, and we've already talked about how to get the length of a list. But now let's talk about how to iterate through a list. So there's two ways you can iterate through a list. The easier one is to use the for each loop. So for name in names, let's just print name. And the harder way is you can use an index. And why would you want to use an index? That's if you need the, in, uh, the indices for some reason. So in this example, what I'll do is I'll create an index for index in, uh, and then you can't just use names. You have to use range. And then it has to be the length of names. And you notice we don't have to subtract one here. Why is that? Well, it's because range will give you the range from zero to this parameter minus one. 
So you can see how that everybody kind of assumes that things are zero based. So for each index, we're going to print both the index and then the names at i. Uh, oh, yeah, not i, index. There we go. So those are two, two different ways that you can loop over a list. We call it iteration. Uh, there's some other things they want us to show you. So how can you pick out a random element in here? Well, remember that we have random, but if I just type in random here, it's going to complain it doesn't know what random is. So I actually have to import random right here. Now when I type in random, it knows that it's a module. So uh, I'm going to do random dot rand int, and that takes two parameters. The f where you want to start from, what's the lowest, and then what is the maximum that you're going to to um, to look for, and it's going to look at um, it's going to include the maximum value. So what we have to do is we have to actually take the length of names, and then we have to subtract one. And then let's put this all in names, use that as an index. So if I do this several times, it should be randomly picking a name out of this list. There we go. So that's how you pick a, a random item. And then what they want to do is they're going to pick a correct answer and then ask who is in the index, give the name, and then you have to enter the particular thing. So now let's take a look at how this code actually works. We're pretty much down to, to running this. So I showed you how to create a list, showed you different options there. I showed you how you can loop through a list and iterate it. You can pick out a random item in it. And now all that's left is picking that, that string out of it and then asking, um, asking the user which element it is in that. So um, this is going to say who is in index 4, for example. And then it's already going to know who's at index 4 because it was... Um, we've already pulled that out there. So now it's just a question of prompting the user and then we can test whether it's the right answer or not. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, so there's the list. Who's at index zero? Well, that's Julie. And I did it right. Now let's run it and let's, do, let's get it wrong. Who's at index two? Well, let's say Meron. Oh, I got it wrong. Index two is Simba. So that works. And that is what they wanted to show you. Now let's go to the next problem, which is heads up. Now this game, they actually want you to write the code for heads up. And, but I'm going to do it the same way as before. We're just going to jump into terminal and play around a bit to understand what, what it is we need to do. The first thing I want to show you in terminal is uh, how to deal with files. So in terminal, by the way, if you haven't already figured out, you click on this here, you can actually see what files are available in your workspace. So we have a cswords.txt file, and it's got all these words here. Let's go down here and fire up Python. And they show you some sample code for how to access files. And I'm not going to do it exactly that way, um, because you know it's a little bit more complicated than needed. So we have uh, dealt last week with images. You learned that images are an object, and objects have data and methods. Same thing here. A file is not... A lot of people confuse what's the difference between a file name and a file. So in this case, a file name like cswords.txt. Let's just go ahead and put this in. So if I type in file name, you see that's just a string. It's just a, a series of bytes. There's really nothing to it. 
but a file is an object. That object has data, which is going to be the context the tense of that file, and methods. And uh, there's going to be a, a bunch of different things you can do on the file, mainly that allows you to read the file. So let's go ahead and use the code here. I'm going to create um, file equals open of uh, file name. So open is a special function that will create a special object. So now when I look at file, you see that it's not just a bunch of characters. It's not a bunch of characters that are in the file. File is actually an object. It's of type io.textio wrapper. And it has a piece of data that's the name of the file name. It's got the mode that it's supposed to be accessing it in. It's got the encoding. So these are all things that are hidden from the user. But we can now do things with this file. So one simple thing we can do is we can actually iterate through the file. And we can do a for each. And when you do a for each iterating through the file, it's going to give you one line at a time. So I will say for line in file. And here, let me sh let me show you what's different. So what happens if I do for line in file name print line? What does that do? So you see that file name is just a string. It's just a bunch of characters. And so when you do the for each in a string, it's going to give them to you one character at a time. But a file is not just a bunch of characters. A file is an object. It's got various methods, including how to iterate through it. And it's going to iterate one line at a time. So let me go back and let's change it instead of being file name to being file, which I opened previously. So now you can see there's a whole bunch of lines in here. And you notice that there's a blank line between each. Why is that? This is another peculiarity of Python. It doesn't happen in other, other languages. So when you read that line, uh, it's not really a problem. Yeah, it is a problem with a language because the file reading is built into the language. So when you when you read the file lines, you, really you would think that it's not going to give you the new line at the end of the line because obviously the new line is breaking the line. Um, but it is. So what we have to do is we have to strip that line off of it. And there's a function that that lets us do that, thankfully. So if you take line and actually here this is a this is a good um eh, it's a little bit hard to do but line is again not just a string you would think that it's a string but you can actually no actually it is a string i think i think it is a string and the the strip is a, is a function on all the strings line.strip um let's go ahead and run this and then let's play with it a little bit oh right because file has state i actually have to close the file File.close, and now I can go back and reopen the file. Okay, now let's go back and here do this. Okay, it printed out a whole lot of stuff. Oh, I forgot to do line.strip open print close print. <laughs> strip is a and oh, here, this is great. Look, it says strip is a built-in method, built-in method strip of string object. Okay, so that tells us exactly what I was just talking about. Line is a string, and it has a strip method. Uh, but I didn't actually execute it. So by putting these parens in, now I'm actually going to execute that. Oh, once again, I have to close the file, and let's reopen it. Oh, this may be a good point to show the other way to doing this, but let, let's go ahead and do this one more time. Open the file. And now, there we go. Now, what I was going to say is, so what's happening each time is when file is an object, it's not just a string, right? And so that object has state. One of the pieces of state is where is it in the file? So when you finish reading it, file now has um, nothing more to read. And that's when I when I executed the second time, nothing happened. So there's another command that they show you here, with as. And what with as does is it opens that file, does the work, and then closes the file at the end. So we can actually put all of this together into with um, open file name 
as file, then print. Uh, now I have to do for, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna I was gonna write this all out, but this is so much code. Let's just go. Let's just go start actually doing some code now. Um, it's gonna get a little, getting a little complicated. So let's see what else to show you. So I showed you how to open files. Um, I was gonna show you. Um, yeah, I've, no, I've already shown you that that each line you get is a string, and you can operate on the string with like upper, lower, strip. Okay, what else do we need to do? Um, I think we can start jumping into the code. We may come back to terminal or not. So this game, what the, the game is, is that they want us to show each of these words one at a time. And the, the user has to hit enter. And the idea is that the person who's being asked the questions uh, is just going to have to close their eyes and then the class can ask me what um, what I think the word is. So I'm going to have to read this file, and then I'm going to have to have a loop, right? And it's an indefinite loop because we don't know how many words there are. And actually, we really want that loop to run forever. Um, so we want a while loop that's going to uh, pick a random word, one word out of the list, and we already know how to pick a random word out of a list. It's going to display it, and then loop again and have us hit enter and display another word. So the first thing that we talked about doing there is we have to somehow open the file, all right? Got to open the file and read it. And then the next thing is we, oh, you have a completion. And then the next thing is uh, we have to play the game. And we'll get to what the game is. <laughs> That's going to drive me crazy. So let's make a couple of functions here. Let's have an open open file. And let's have that take a file name. And actually, let's have it be read file, right? So what this is going to do is it's going to open the file. read the file and now we're going to think about where is it going to read it well it's going to read it into a list of words right that should be quizmanship should tell you that but the question is where do we create that that list of words and how do we get it back so there's a couple different options the simplest option is we just have a uh, word list right here and I'm just going to create it empty so that way we don't actually have to create it here but the alternative to be clear you can create the list here and then return it to over here or you could even create it in here in main and then pass it in as another argument and then have it be returned um, because lists are mutable and this is something that a number of students are getting confused about. Um, what things are mutable, what things are immutable. It makes a difference when you start passing them in as arguments. So if a list were not mutable, then no matter what you did to it in read file, it would not be reflected when it came back. Um, but these are all advanced concepts, so don't worry about that if it, if it gets you confused. So the simplest thing is we just have that word list be global. So we're going to read the file into word list. And um, so we're going to open the file and read it by calling read file. And we're going to pass in a file name. So that's going to be file name. Now we're going to have to play, play game. <laughs> that, that got confused. So let's have another function called play game. And we'll have to think about what parameters we might want to pass in. So again, there are a couple different options here. So what does play game need in order to operate? Well, it needs that list of words. So if you wanted to have it as a local um, to main, regardless of whether you created it in read file or main, you would have to pass it in here. But since we're going to have it as a global, 
we don't need to worry about that. Um, is there any other state? Um, as long as play game actually does all the looping within itself, then I don't think there's any other state. If you if play game only played like one iteration of the game, um, or if there was a score or something, you might have to return something or pass something in, but there really isn't. So play game, it just has to have a loop forever. So a loop forever, and inside that loop, what should it do? It should print a random word, and then, um, and we, we, we might want to break this up into another function, you know, let's have, um, let's have a find a random word. Now we're going to print the word. And then finally we'll, uh, wait for enter. So when the user hits enter, it'll go back to loop, find another word, print it and wait. So these are all good functions. So it would be a good exercise for you to stop the video and to try to implement these functions. There's a read file function. There's a play game function. And there's also another one here. Um, let's call it random word. So it doesn't really need any inputs because we're going to actually calculate what we're going to do. This one should, should calculate random index from word list and then return the word. So again, because our word list is global, we don't have to worry about it. If it wasn't global, we would have to pass in word list here so that we could calculate, um, not only uh, get it here, but also calculate the length of it here. So this will, uh, um, this will be a good exercise for you. Write the random word function, so it's gonna return a random word and write the play game function. So that's going to loop and then the, the read file. So you should stop the video and do those on your own. But for now, I'm going to assume that you've done that and had a good, good shot at it. And that's really the most important thing is to try to do it on your own because it's that recall of information forcing you to learn by your mistakes that is going to be the learning and really reinforce it into your mind. But let's go ahead and start doing these and let's think about ways that we can do this so we can test each of these one at a time. Um, so for example, what if I tried to write random word first? Well, I don't have a list, so that's not going to work. Uh, what if I tried to play, do write play game first? Well, I don't have a random, uh, a list of words. So really let's start by reading the file. Okay. Let's do that. And then we can just like print the, the, the words out to verify that works. So let's go back to the code that we talked about before. So we'll do it the fancy way. We'll say with open of file name as file. And now we're going to read those files into a word list. So we've already got the word list created. So what we have to do is for each line in that file, we're going to not print, but we're going to now put it into um, word list dot append and we will append line. But remember, if we just put line in, well, let's let's go ahead and do it. We'll just just put line in. Let's move this comment up. Always put your comments before. for the code. And let me quickly check. Oh yeah, the Java guy is always forgetting his colon. So first thing I need to do is put a colon there and yeah, that fixed it. Okay. So we're going to read the file and then for now, let's just go ahead and we'll put the testing right here. So for word in word list, print 
word. And let's just run that. So that should give us, oh, I forgot some more colons, right? Colon, colon, let's try running that. Uh, indentation and line 30. Oh yeah, okay, we need to have a pass here. I'm probably gonna need a pass here. There we go. So we have got these words and we've got them separated by a blank line. So remember how do we fix that? We have to strip that line, line dot strip. And you can see you can actually strip particular characters, but if you don't pass any characters, it's just gonna strip off that carriage return. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, now this is looking better. So we've got our, our list of words. So now let's go look into play game. So play game. We're gonna get rid of our pass. And we're gonna loop forever. So how do we loop forever? That is simply while true. How do we find a random word? So we've got word list and we want to calculate the length of it. So we're going to take the length of that and then we want to save that. So let's say length equals len of word list. You know, one thing that you might ask yourself, you should you really should ask yourself is why isn't it word list dot now see we've got various options here append clear copy count why isn't it word list dot len and you see there actually is a a funny length here um and uh, it's it's actually an interesting read if you google why does python use len of word list uh, of list instead of list dot len it's an interesting read, but basically it boils down to um, the developer thought that it looked more readable doing len here. But unfortunately, it's inconsistent when you start creating your own um, methods. So it's just food for thought. So, so we've calculated the length, and now we need to find a random word. So let's, let's go ahead and do those separate steps again. So random... index equals random dot rand int takes two arguments first one is the lower index the second one is the length minus one and let me just double check what this yeah okay that's fine we just haven't used it yet so now we've now calculated the random index Oh, you know what? <laughs> I forgot. We were actually going to put this into random word. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's take these two lines, put them down here. And then the last thing is I needed to return the word. So now we're going to return word list index random index and now we should be able to test this function out so let's see here um so word well in order to test it out we're gonna have to write this code word equals random word and then print that word out so print word and then wait for enter. So we can just do input with nothing there. So let's go ahead and try running that. Okay, so it just printed all the words out, I think. Okay, so why didn't it stop for input? So while true, it's going to get the random word, it's going to print the word, and then it's going to input, let's put enter, press enter. 
Let's try running that. Is it ever, okay, so it's printing all the words, and then at the very end, it's doing press enter. Random word is a word. Okay, so it calculates what a random word is, and then it prints it. Oh, did we, did we forget? Oh, I forgot that it was, yeah, this is the problem here. So my test case here, <laughs> forgot to remove that. Now this is going to look a lot better. Okay, so there we go. Now, we don't actually want it to say press enter, so let's get rid of that code that was there. Let's try running that. Okay, so now this is looking better. Python suitcase pixel. But now we've got a blank line. How do we get rid of the blank line? Um, well, one thing you could do is what's happening is it's printing Word and then it's down here and then it's doing input. So if we didn't actually carriage return here, we could solve that problem. So we can actually do end equals quote quote. And that will make it so it doesn't print a carriage return. So let's try running that. So now you can do that. And there's another option. You could, instead of printing separately and then inputting, you could actually input for the word itself. And now we can combine these two. So now it's printing the word and getting the input all in one step. Okay, so now let's take a look at this code and see what we've learned. So the main thing that this heads up game teaches you is about files. That was, that was really the goal. So we took a file. Now remember the distinction between the file name and the actual file. And remember that you could, you can just open the file and store it as a file, but you can do the with as, and then it will automatically close it for you as well. Um, and we learned how to iterate through the file one line at a time. And that when you do that, you're going to have to actually strip those lines, the carriage returns. And, um, I think you've seen this while true before. So, uh, in order to stop this, I have to, you know, hit control C to, to end it. Um, I could also ask it and say, you know, enter quit, for example, to, to end it. And then I have to modify this from while true to while input doesn't equal quote quote. Uh, let's see, what else here? So we, again, we did this in the last exercise where we looked at the uh, getting a random word from the list. So yeah, the main thing in this function is uh, dealing with files. And files are very important. I've actually written a lot of programs that deal with files. Um, in Java and uh, Python does a great job that as well. So now let's talk about the extension problem, assuming you were able to deal with that. Um, now they've get, got some real data files here. So they've got data files for a lot of different countries and these are the total case counts. So from day 265 to day 266, it increased by some number here that you can calculate by subtracting one from the other. And what they want you to do is they want you to read this entire file with how many lines? 478 lines. And remember, you're going to have to strip those lines. And the, since we want to deal with them as integers, you probably want to store the, the list of integers. You could store it as strings, but then you'll just need to convert it to integers later. And you want to count up how many lines there are. And you want to, you want to have to figure out for each day how many new cases there are. Because each day there may only be a hundred or a thousand cases, even though these numbers are, are really, really big. Um, and so you want to figure out the delta between each day for 477 uh, differences there. And then you want to sum those all up. And if you do it right, this is the number you should come up with, 4,139,160. And we're not going to show you the code for that, but um, it's very similar. We've already shown you how do you open a file, how do you iterate through the file, 
in previous, um, so we've shown you today how to how to store those as a list of strings, but you've previously seen how to convert strings to integers. And um, this is going to require probably, well, you could do it a couple different ways, but one way to do it would be to create two lists, one with a list of all the raw data, and the second be a list of all the deltas between each day. Or you could do it more complex by having a running total each, looking at each day and the day before and calculating how many, what's the difference, and then adding that to a sum. You have to, you have to have a, 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 a um, the previous day's data remembered. Um, so that makes it a little bit tougher to do it that way. So I would recommend you do it with two lists to start. Um, but you can play around with this. This is there's some real data here, and uh, yeah, that'll be a good test to see how well you learned. So before I leave you, I want to talk about what kind of things you can do after Stanford Code in place. So you've had a five-week crash course in Python um, at my community college when we teach Python. It's a ten-week course, so obviously we, we were really rushed through here. Well, we did actually cover a lot. Um, so for example, dictionaries. Uh, we have mentioned it, but it's not involved in today's section, so that's a great area where you could spend some more time learning. Um, there, uh, there is no continuation to Stanford code in place. There is a 106, a Stanford 106B, but it is taught in C++, so it's not really, don't look forward to, to, to seeing the, um, the 106B in a Stanford code in place, because that, that's going to require a lot of work. Instead, there's a lot of other resources out on the internet, and I won't try to mention all of them, but there are certainly uh, many what they call MOOCs, uh, massively online courses, and uh, those don't have any section leaders like we had in Stanford Code in Place. That's what really makes Stanford Code in Place unique, but it's got the same idea where you've got, you know, many weeks, it's, they're generally self-paced. And so that's one way to do things. I would definitely recommend you try to find a course where you have example problems that you can try out on your own. Because again, nobody ever learns by just reading a book. And nobody ever learns by just watching videos. The only way you learn is by actually programming yourself. Go in there and, you know, and with Python especially, go into the interpreter and actually type stuff in, really understand how it works, and then use those basic skills to apply to simple problems, and then apply those simple problems to larger complex problems. And in a well-designed course, that progression is available. So look for programs that have that type of integration. And there are paid courses that are based on textbooks. I saw one that was actually available for very little money, about $10. So that's another option. Um, there's, there's no limit of websites that can teach you about Python. There's a whole series of websites that are kind of like a hacker rank where they just challenge you with one problem after the other. The problem with that is it's, you know, right, they're not, what you want is you want a video that shows you here's the functions and then you want a series of problems that you work on which test your knowledge of what they just taught you which is what we've been doing in Stanford Code in place so um, yeah keep keep an eye out for for something that's going to give you that type of immediate feedback I think is very important but really in the end the thing I've always believed, uh, it's, it's true of myself, and I, I always tell people, if you want to be a great programmer, what you really need to do is to find something you're interested in working on and just put your heart and soul into it. There are a lot of internet resources. You know, certainly you can just look on Stack Override for almost any question you can think of, and someone will have an answer. Um, so, for example, um, my project with COVID WA was all about going out to all these different retailer websites and scraping those websites. And a lot of people used Python. They used a um, library called Beautiful Soup that allowed them to drive the website and click the buttons. Um, maybe you have a, a website that you go to frequently where you, you know, you're always having to click these buttons or you're checking to see if something has changed. Look at Python and Beautiful Soup and see if you can automate some of that. I think that's a great option. Um, but if you find a project like that, that is the best way to learn because it will expose you to needing to read files to you know like json files on the internet and to processing those files and learning about data structures 
you know, lists and dictionaries are great, but there's other more complex data structures you might want as well. It's going to teach you about the, the web and all sorts of great things like that. So that is my number one recommendation. Find something that you're interested in and maybe find a project like COVID Wa where you can learn and be trained and help at the same time. I think that's an excellent option for you as well. So I hope that you've learned a lot from Stanford Code in Place. I do have a complete channel, Mighty CS Man, which is contains two college uh, community college courses in Java. It's one CS 142 and 143. First 10 weeks takes you through chapters uh, 1 through 8 of a book called Building Java Programs. And CS 143 takes you through 10 weeks of chapters 8 through 16. And that is a complete course in Java. And I every single one of my lectures that I give to my students is available online on my YouTube channel. So that's an option. I, if you are interested in learning Java, I suggest you go there. Um, and I'm sure there, there must be other people out there doing this for Python too as well, but I, unfortunately I don't know who they are. So, uh, But there's going to be some good threads in Ed that will try to summarize some of those things. So I hope you some, get, some, uh, get some feedback from, from that as to what would be good websites you could use. Thank you very much for your attention for the last five weeks. I hope you learned a lot. And I hope you continue to pursue your education in computer science. It's a really exciting field with a lot of opportunities, not only to um, make money, but also to give back to society, as I found with covid -Wa. So I hope that someday you will be able to give back, just like I've been able to give back to you guys. Thank you very much.